You are listening to Feeling Good, a podcast for dentists. I'm Dr. Laura Mock, the life coach for busy dentists. This podcast explores how to feel better in all aspects of our lives so that we can be our best leaders. If you have been feeling stressed about being the owner of your practice and you want to change what you are getting at work and in your personal life, you are in the right place. Well, hi there. I'm Dr. Laura Mock, and welcome to another episode of my podcast. Today, I'm calling this episode The COVID Quits, and I'm going to tell you why here in just a second. But just to let you know, this is another one of my episodes that's better listened to with the video. So wherever you found this um this episode, if it was in iTunes or Spotify or Stitcher, you can definitely listen to it on there, but you'll miss some of the notes. Uh, if you're listening to it and you're like, eh, maybe it would work out better. You can go to my website, thelifecoachforbusydentist.com and find it under the podcast tab. All right, well, let's get started. Why do you think I named this episode, The COVID Quits? Well, I will tell you. I have a confession to make, which is that, you know, I've been off of work now for, I think, seven weeks. And about three or four weeks into it, I started fantasizing about uh, not coming back to dentistry. (laughs) I thought, you know, my practice is worth quite a bit. I could sell it. And then maybe I could move into a tiny house. My kids could go to community college. Maybe I could just, um, I actually, this one is a little bit embarrassing, but I always like to let you guys know all the stupid things I do. I actually looked up what it took to become a mortician (laughs) because I was like, what would be easily transferable? Dentistry to what? How about mortician? I don't have to worry about hurting anybody or, um, you know, PPE making my hygienist happy, all those things. Anyway, so what I'm going to do today is I'm going to talk to you about what I went through with my mind while I was considering exiting dentistry. You know, I even though I'm a life coach, I have my own practice. I've owned it for 13 years, and I still work there three, three and a half days a week, and it's a busy practice. But I just want to go over some of the things that I caught myself thinking during this time. I made a little list. How about this one? I don't know how to navigate all these decisions. Oh my gosh, do we not have the most decisions to make right now? It's insane how many things we got to decide. Which masks are we going to do? What are hours going to look like? Which loan should I get? Which grants should I apply for? What should I tell my team? What should I tell my patients? Is it better to show my patients all the PPE I have now? Or is it better to just act like we're all having fun? I don't know. So many decisions to make. Um, How about this one? I can't reinvent this. Oh my goodness, I have thought that so many times because I know I need to change things, but it feels like a behemoth. It feels like one of those aircraft carriers and it's going in a certain direction and it's my job to turn it. Like, I don't know. I, I have these thoughts that I don't know how to reinvent my practice. How about this one? I can't practice dentistry with so much crap on my face. How many of you have thought that to yourselves? I'm like, okay, an N95 and a face shield and my loops and a head covering? Like, are my, are my dental patients even gonna know that I take pride in my appearance anymore? I'm just gonna look like one of those um, pandemic robots or something, and, and where's the personal touch in that? Uh, I don't know when to reopen. This is too hard. I mean, the list goes on and on. I've had all of these thoughts. And basically what came, what it came down to is all of those thoughts funneled into some conclusions that my brain came up with, which are here. Maybe I should sell my practice. Maybe I should quit dentistry altogether. I'll just sell it. I'll walk away. I'll move to Montana and grow lavender for a living or I'll just let my husband support me. All those things that came together. And of course, since I'm a life coach, I started thinking, okay, well, why is my brain doing this right now? Why is my brain coming up with these solutions? And so then I set to work 
to really look at what has been happening in this neurological organ of mine that lives between my ears. So there's a couple of principles that we know about how human brains work, and I'm going to go over some of them, and then I'm going to step to the side and you're going to be able to see the chart that I'm working on here. But um, first, I want to go over these principles that we know about what our brains want. Number one, our brains have a tendency to want to make us stay in the cave. And what I mean by that is your brain's job is to keep you safe. So we're not talking about 21st century America right now. We're talking about a thousand years ago when we lived in a cave. If we stayed in the cave, then no monsters were going to come and attack us, right? And we weren't going to get stung by bees or whatever. If we were in the cave where the brain knew we were safe, then it was better to stay there than to step out into the unknown. The brain is an organ and it is on a mission and that is to keep you alive. That's its job. Evolution gave it that job and its job is not to make you feel happy. All right, number two, we understand about the human brain that in, and well, not just the human brain, but any animal brain, we have something that drives our behavior called the motivational triad. Have you guys heard about this before? So now I'm pointing at my first chart, motivational triad, okay? So there's three things that we seek or not seek as living beings. The first one is that we seek pleasure. And this is, you know, for example, you're eating a berry, you're cuddling with your partner, you're, you're holding your baby, that you just had and you're snuggling it up to your cheek and it's so soft and everything. So that's seeking pleasure. And that's all, all those things that I just mentioned are good for nature. They're good for evolution. They're good for your survival. So it just makes sense. Uh, the next one is to, to avoid pain. So you try to not get burned by the fire. You try not to get poked in the foot. You um, avoid overworking your muscles. And these also, these are not good for survival. So your body has taught you how to avoid those things that feel painful. And then the last one is energy efficiency. And this is a principle of the universe, really, because there's only so much energy to be had in this universe, right? You can't create more energy. And so less energy for tasks equals a better chance for survival. Now, if you look at this motivational triad and you think about being off work for COVID and try to put yourself in here somewhere, it kind of makes sense. Like going back to work and putting all that headgear on, that seems uncomfortable. Plus it seems really hard. Like it's a lot of work. Now we have to clean the rooms extra and we have to tell our team new things to do. It just makes sense that our brain would be freaking out because this COVID situation and going back is the opposite of the motivational triad. Number three, this is another thing that we know about our brains and the universe. Do you guys remember Newton's law about an object at rest tends to stay at rest? You get all that friction that you have to overcome in order to get moving again, right? You remember the coefficient of friction from physics class that you had to take before you got into dental school? The coefficient meaning there's an extra amount of work that's involved in getting something moving again. I always experience this when school starts again and my teenagers want to stay in bed like they're used to. And I'm like, come on, do I got to push you out of bed here? So if you've ever come back from maternity leave or a long break, you know that as you're getting ready, to go back into this busy lifestyle that we have, there's this kind of eh, extra push that you need. And it's not that it's, once you get moving again, it's not that bad, but you, you kind of have to get moving again after that, that, re, that object of rest stuff. And then the last thing that I wanna point out in, as we search for reasons why we would fantasize about quitting dentistry altogether is that the unknowns in our brains are the scariest thing. And I always point out that if you think about a really scary movie, the scariest thing is not really understanding what is happening, what is going on with that monster. What does the monster even look like or the alien? And, they, and the movie makers keep it unknown in order to create tension. And our lives are like that right now. We don't really know what this enemy is and how we're going to make our new practices. So 
the fact that it's unknown makes it scary or makes me want to run away from it. So what I want you to understand in all these things that I've just explained to you is that wanting to escape from our practices is not only natural, but it's understandable. But I also want to point out that it's also not necessarily correct. It might be correct, it might not be correct, but it's very helpful to look at these reasons why it's tempting to want to run away, understand that the reasons are biological and psychological, and that deflates them because you can see now that it's just your brain being your human brain. So let's dive a little bit more into why our brain does this, okay? So your brain has a secret agenda and it was placed there by evolution. Your brain wants you to do two things and it's the same as what nature wants. Stay alive and make babies. Your brain doesn't really understand 21st century America and how to try to keep you from being not stressed. It just wants to make sure that you don't get injured, that you stay alive, and that you make more babies. And this is another really important uh, message that I want you to understand. Your brain is not you. Okay, so I'm me, I'm Laura, and I have a brain, and I can use my brain, and a lot of times I'm on autopilot using my brain, whether I'm driving to the grocery store, or, uh, or I'm driving to work, or I'm going on a run, or whatever, but when I start thinking about my life, I can leave my brain on autopilot, and it will happily take over and try to keep me safe and making babies, or I can use my brain's higher functions that I have because I am a human to take the reins of the brain and be in charge and think more, what's the word I wanna use? I'll come up with more intentionally, there it was. I might be 45, but I can come up with my words still. <laughs> we can think more intentionally if we wanna turn off the autopilot and take charge of what we're thinking. All right, so that's where life coaching comes in, right? And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you some models that I made as I was considering um, how I've been thinking and feeling. So I'm going to turn my page. So I made a model here. And just for any of you who have not um, listened to any of my podcasts before, the model is a way that we can analyze any situation, whether it be good or bad, and break it down into its different parts. And the first part is a circumstance, which is just the neutral facts of the situation. And when we have circumstances, those lead to thoughts. So, and the thoughts are just, you know, they're neurological processes in our brain that are helping us interpret the data that comes into our brain around us. And our thoughts, lead to our feelings. Every time we have a thought, it's going to create an emotion in us. And so what I have here is F. So C stands for circumstance, T stands for thought, F stands for feeling. And our feeling or our emotions cause us to take action. That's why they're called emotions, meaning to make move. So our emotions, you know, if I feel scared, then I'm gonna run, for example. And then our actions result to what we have created in our lives, and that's our results, okay? So for our circumstances, what I chose to put down, and um, you know, I'm talking now about how I've been feeling tempted to sell my practice and move to Montana and sell lavender, right? So the circumstances, my practice has been closed since, and then I put a, a blank, for me, it's been closed since March 5th, because we were on, vacation already the week that everybody was like, oh my gosh, we have to close. So my, my practice has been closed since March 5th and we're going to reopen and I'm not exactly sure, but for me, it's probably going to be around June 1st. That's my, that's my circumstance, it's the neutral facts. Nobody can argue with that right there, okay? And then I had a lot of thoughts. <laughs> I did and I told you some of them at the beginning of the podcast. But the one that I chose that was the most triggering for me 
was, I don't know how to navigate all these decisions. Like I start thinking about all the decisions that I have to make and I go from one to the next, to the next, to the next. I don't actually make any decisions. I just make lists of decisions that I need to make. It's very overwhelming. And actually what I end up feeling is afraid. I don't know what's going to happen to my practice. I don't know what's going to happen to my, my patients and my team. And I'm afraid because I don't know. Remember I told you the unknown is the scariest thing. So this thought is what created this afraid feeling, okay? It's not the fact that we're closed or that we're going to open. It's the fact that I thought I don't know what decisions to make. That made me feel afraid. And then my actions, I made a big list and that I have a brief, I have them abbreviated here, but I'm just going to read them from my list here. So when I feel afraid, I think a lot about how hard it all is. Like I, mm, I'm sitting there thinking and I'm driving, but I'm thinking and I'm on my run, but I'm thinking this sucks. This is hard. I don't know what to do. And then I make a bunch of to-do lists. But instead of doing the to-do list, I just fret over them or I don't look at them again or I stare at them, but actually don't take any action at all because I'm afraid. And so when I'm feeling afraid, obviously my brain wants me to stay in the cave where it already knows I'm safe. I'm already unemployed. I already know that's okay. Maybe I'm just going to stay here. I lay awake and worry. I get onto Facebook groups. And I look and see what everybody else is doing and how they're all arguing with each other. And I also picture myself being back at work, feeling too busy, too hot, too suffocating, and too poor for nothing. Because is my dental practice even going to make money again? I don't know. Like, this is my brain. This is what it's doing. It's freaking out. And then also, I complain to my friends. And if you are my friend and you have listened to me complain, thank you. For just listening. I appreciate you. Um, and then, of course, my last line is I make plans to sell my practice. <laughs> I didn't actually take any concrete steps towards that, but I thought about it. It's a good practice and it's not for sale, but I thought about putting it up for sale. And what this created, all these actions created a result for me, which is that I still don't know how to navigate all these decisions. Since I was afraid, I didn't take any action towards knowing how to navigate all these decisions. I avoided them and I stewed and I hemmed and hawed. And so I stayed in that place where I didn't know how to navigate all these decisions. Now, what I really want you to see, because this is how you apply this model to yourself, is I want you to see that this thought is where everything got dangerous. I don't know how to navigate all these decisions, created all of this. So if I want to change things, I don't change it by making a new to-do list. I already saw it. making a to-do list isn't effective if I'm feeling afraid. What I have to do to make a change in my life is to look at my brain and choose a new thought. All right, so I did this again and I made a new thought. But what I first did was I asked myself, so I know that my practice is closed and I know when, when it's going to reopen, but this time, instead of not knowing how to navigate my decisions, what do I want my final result to be? And you could choose any result for yourself. I'm going to tell you which one I chose, but just know that you can choose anything that you think would be the best result for you. And I chose, I am successfully navigating changes despite being uncomfortable at times. Okay, so I mean, there's opportunities left and right, right? I, there's things happening right now, everything's changing, and smart people will recognize that opportunities exist when things are changing. And I want to be successfully navigating these changes. No matter what the outcome ends up being, I want to be able to say that that's how I showed up. So then what I did was I said, okay, so the practice is closed. I'm successfully navigating changes. So how do I need to act? So I'm working backwards here. How do I need to act in order to be successfully navigating? And this is what I said. So I'm going to research guidelines 
uh, research guidelines from my board and the CDC taking notes because that helps me make a concrete plan and figure out how to integrate the safety measures into my practice. And then I'm going to take time to visualize what I want my practice to be in a year. Now, maybe it's not gonna end up being exactly like that in a year, but I'm gonna visualize and write down what I think that's gonna take. And then I'm going to make an action plan based on the science and my visualization. That way I'm being intentional for what I'm going for, right? But here's what's interesting. I'm not gonna take any of those specific actions if I'm feeling afraid. Right, because if I'm feeling afraid, then my brain's gonna want me to stay in the cave and I'm gonna do what I did on the other page. So I need to choose what feeling I am going to need in order to take these actions. And I chose confident. But you could just as easily choose hopeful, excited, optimistic, amazed, grateful. Grateful's a great one. Love's always a good one. I chose confident because when I feel confident, I actually take action. And then what's really important is, so if I wanna feel confident, I don't get the luxury of leaving my brain on autopilot and thinking I don't know how to navigate all these decisions because that's a scary thought. I have to choose a new thought and I have to practice the thought and embrace it and let it become a part of me. And this is the thought that I chose, but you know, there's a million you could choose, but this is what I chose. I've done hard things before, and I'm going to tackle this with my abilities that are already proven. So a lot of times when I'm feeling like I want to be more confident, one of the things that I'll do is I'll think about what I've already accomplished because I am amazed at all of the things that I've accomplished. And maybe that makes me sound egotistical. I don't care. <laughs> I grew up in a family where they expected the girls to just stay home. I, I don't wanna make it sound like that's not very much work because it's a ton of work, but no girls went and got professional careers where I was from and we were low income. I had to get a job when I was 14 to buy my lunches and my clothes. So for me to go from that to being the owner of this dental practice and a life coach, and I write articles and I speak and I teach people, I help people have a better life. And I'm like, damn, if I can do all that, I can reopen this dental practice. I can reference the fact that I've been through these hard things, to, which I, is totally believable for me, and I, can, and I can do this hard thing. And then we'll see where it goes from there. So I thought of another good thought that I wanted to introduce just in case someone else liked that. Oh yeah, it's something I already referenced, but I wanna say it again, just in case you find it um, confidence building. Successful people find opportunities. And this is an opportunity, folks. So if that's something that makes you feel confident or makes you feel the feeling that you want in order to get the result you want, then I would say, Take that sentence and tattoo it on your eyelids because the next thing that's going to happen is once you feel that good feeling from that excellent thought, your brain already has a habit of thinking the other thing and it thinks it's like being really helpful to reintroduce, oh, but you don't know how to navigate all these decisions. It's going to like remind you because it's trying to be helpful and <laughs> we have to keep the autopilot off and continue to remind ourselves. I want to read it again. I've done hard things before, and I'm going to tackle this with my abilities that are already proven. So you see there's an intentional part to this. There's a purposeful part in repeating the sentence and feeling the feeling that you want in order to get you to take the actions that you want. And this is the essence of life coaching, folks. This is helping you see what's happening in your brain, in your brain and helping you choose something for your brain that's more useful, that's more purposeful that for the thing that you really want to have or things that you don't want to have. And that is all I have for you today. And it's been such a pleasure. You know, we're to our 20th episode here. I can't believe it's been 20 because I only do two per month, but we somehow we got there. And I'm just so thankful for each of you, my listeners. I love hearing from you. I'd love to hear from you again. Oh, and I could use a few more reviews if you're willing to get on iTunes and let other people know that this podcast is helpful. Thank you, everybody. Good night. 
Thank you for listening to Feeling Good, a podcast for dentists. To download my free workbook on how better leadership starts with your feelings, go to my website, thelifecoachforbusydentist.com and click on Get Free Help.